everybody except some new students uh, will know Andrew uh, and will know really of what has become over a kind of decade his, and I don't think it's an exaggeration to say kind of devotion, a kind of imaginative devotion to the school. Um, he's formerly known at the AA uh, uh, as visiting architectural critic. Um, it's a title, you know, which is worthy of the AA's duplicity. Uh, that is to say, it expects an enormous amount of work um, for you wouldn't believe how little money. Uh, <laughs> uh, which is, of course, the AA's traditional way of doing business with kind of important intellectuals. Um, so we do extend at this moment both for this evening and for other evenings because Andrew will be here uh, at different points that four times over the year. Uh, he will be running a kind of short course for the graduate school, but other people are welcome next term. And we've arranged that he will be here for the MA presentations in history and theory uh, in the summer term. But as always, when he's here, he has a kind of constant round of kind of meeting with students and talking about their work. Uh, and you should take advantage of that. As you probably know, Andrew was professor of philosophy uh, at Warwick. Um, he's been deeply influential in the kind of emergence of you know, what is often misleadingly thought of as post-structuralist philosophy, and in particular, kind of its relevance uh, to architecture. He is currently teaching in Sydney. Uh, but at the same time maintains a kind of extraordinarily itinerant existence throughout the world, lecturing, looking at, thinking about, and talking about architecture. Uh, tonight he's going to talk, I think, from the new book on painting uh, about Malevich. Uh, sometimes when I say this, it has a sort of formal politeness when I say it's a great pleasure. Uh, this is one of those moments when I really mean it's a very great pleasure to introduce Andrew Benjamin. Thank you very much. And to reciprocate, it's of course a great pleasure, as always, to be here. Uh, this paper I'm going to read is, is part of a, an ongoing project uh, on lines and it comes from a book which I'm trying to finish which is called Surfaces and Lines and I became very interested in the history of drawing and the history of the diagram but as I will try and argue how this is needs to be recapitulated uh, the history of drawing needs can't just be posited it needs to be rethought and that's partly what I'm going to suggest tonight so, situating a concern with Malevich necessitates, Malevich, as you know, is the constructivist, Russian painter, architect, working at the turn of the century. Most of the work you'll see tonight takes place between 1915 and 1926. He worked with Lisitsky and a whole series of, of other people who we know as the constructivists. But that is merely to give them historical designation. So, let me begin. Situating a concern with Malevich necessitates a rethinking of the context in which the works were produced. Equally, it will demand a move away from attributing any direct centrality to constructivism as a mere historical moment. Repositioning the work involves giving it a location after the advent of the digital image. In other words, accepting the implicit direction opened up by Walter Benjamin that artworks demand reinterpretation within the conceptual framework presented by the actual presence of technological innovation. That reinterpretation is the afterlife of the work. I mean, the advent of photography, the advent of the digital image, doesn't mean the end of painting. It means that painting has to be reinterpreted 
within the concepts and categories made possible by photography and by the digital image. That's Benjamin's argument, and that provides you know, the Nachleben, or the afterlife of the work. The contention will be that the framework within which Malevich needs, Malevich needs to be understood is one given by the complex relation between abstraction, the image, the image of lines, and production. In a sense, this was always the configuration with, within which Malevich would need to be interpreted. However, here, now, the question of abstraction and lines, the latter's image, thus presence, has to be posed in radically different ways. Now, here I'm going to be very, sort of summarize a much longer argument, but let me just do it this way. I want to draw a distinction between an illustrative image and a generative image. I mean, one of the great dramas, I think, of contemporary architecture is when someone gives you a lecture and shows you a picture of a building or a photoshopped interior, the furthest thing from nature possible of the colors of Photoshop. And, uh, and the question you have to bring to these images is, what are you asking me to look at? Or why is this the image of architecture? Or what is the image of architecture? So we have to be very precise in asking questions. So within this, I want to draw a distinction between an illustrative image, which is possibly the image you find in an architectural magazine or a book of architectural history, and a generative image. The latter, the generative image, approximates the condition of the diagram. The illustrative image only ever refers to what it illustrates. Its definition is given by that location. It figures. The generative image, however, is abstract. Abstraction, however, be very clear about abstraction. Abstraction is not that which exists without figure. Such a formulation, such a formulation merely reduces abstraction to being no more than the negation of figure. The contrary is the case. Abstraction is that which has a potentiality in relation to possible figuration. Figuration is linked within abstraction, within architecture, as opposed to painting, to form creation. In other words, the abstract image has potentiality. And potentiality is one of those words that we have to wrestle with in order to understand. Abstraction, which will always involve a possible opening to figure, has to be defined in relation to its potentiality. It is, in regards to that definition, that the distinction between architectural drawings, abstract lines, if you like, and abstraction in painting needs to be located. One of the, 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 the problems we have is the move between painting and architecture as though it all amounts to the same thing. They're just images. If this is, while this is a painting, we could construe this image architecturally, and were we to do that, we wouldn't reduce it to painting. An addition needs to be made, however. It is not just that abstraction involves potentiality. Potentiality understood as abstraction will always main, maintain a discontinuous relation to the figure. This, I think, is fundamental. That what abstraction means is not the opposite of figure, but is that which contains a discontinuous relationship to figure. Therefore, the movement from abstraction, the movement from the diagram to that which is figural is the movement across a space held open by discontinuity. Now, there's a lot more which one could say, and I should, trust me, I won't, that would need to flesh those positions out. But that's the frame of reference within which I want to interpret or begin to interpret Malevich. Let me begin uh, with a, my, my, one of my favorite Malevich quotations. Any reader of Freud will very much enjoy this quotation. Let me, he says, I quote, We should not resemble our fathers. Their faces, palaces, and temples may be splendid a thousand times over, but our new meaning will not inhabit them. We will build our own, our new world, and thus will not wear the forms of Greece and Rome. We shall not be the peddlers of antiques, end quote. So writes Malevich in 1920 in the Bulletin of the Executive Committee of Moscow State Art Workshops. Now, if there is an element that is fundamental to Malevich's project, 
It is the attempt to move from argumentation to the enactment of this possibility. Were we merely philosophers, we'd think, well, that's a good argument. Let's not peddle antiques. Let's not hang out with our fathers. And God forbid we should look like him. And that would do. But in architecture, that won't do. The criticality inherent in this as a position comes to be realized through form creation, not through simple argumentation. So if there's a distinction between the philosophical or the theoretical on the one hand and the architectural on the other, though there's always a confluence, that distinction resides in the need to see the overcoming of the father, the non-peddling of antiques, etc., through form creation, not simply through argumentation. If there is an element uh, that is fundamental to Malievich's project, it is the attempt, as I'm arguing, to move from simple discursive formulation to the enactment, the formal enactment of this possibility. Note in Malievich's formulation the use of the term resemble. It is not just that we should not resemble our fathers. More importantly, the claim then extends to architecture. Contemporary architecture will, and I quote, not wear the forms of Greece and Rome, thereby leaving open as a question what will be the form of contemporary architecture. Abandoning the form of Greece and Rome is to, not, is to open up a space, a space thought beyond mimesis, a space thought beyond imitation, in which the question of modern architecture is fundamentally the question of what it appears like. So this is a, an argument that you see throughout Europe at this particular moment. Along with fathers, therefore, the already formed figure is brought into question. The figure is not just of the father. The figure itself has to be reconsidered. In other words, it is not a matter of finding another figure, but of rethinking the process of figuration itself. Part of what is at stake here is the positioning of this process beyond any simple opposition between form and content. Once this occurs, then the image, what is presented as the image of architecture, can no longer be simply understood as coterminous with its content. Therefore, to see something as the image of architecture is not simply to describe its content. That is to lapse into the domain of meaning and attribute a meaning to a form. That's not the architectural response. It's to see in what sense this form is generative. It is, it, it, the, the image emerges, therefore, as a question. As, as a beginning, Malevich, Malevich has to be understood as an attempt with the attempt to form and give form to this possibility. In other words, the position is not simply a discursive one, a position involving mere argumentation in sum, what would be present in the province of philosophy. For Malievich, critique, this critical engagement which we move beyond being mere peddlers of techniques, uh, peddlers of antiques, critique is linked to forming, to form creation, and thus opens up the practice of design. Equally, it is not just, uh, it's not just an endeavor that is undertaken merely on the level of form creation. There is a programmatic component. However, it is not defined by function, but by a relation to form creation. An important element can be noted here in regards to questions of form and thus of experimentation in general. If there is a productive distancing that begins to define limits rather than seek conflation between a theoretical or a philosophical position and architecture, one of the points at which it occurs is given by the complex relation, as was intimated, a relation of distance between argumentation and form creation. As you all know, you're all architecture students, the greatest trap, in my opinion, is to begin to tell a story and then point to the work as the realization of your story. This never works. You go to the work, the diagram, the model, and tell the story of that. And in telling the story of that, you're telling the story of the way in which it is as architecture, not the way it becomes an example of a wish fulfillment that you might have. So what you can then read in Malievich are concerned not with being convincing on the level of argument, but being convincing on the level of form creation itself. Moreover, the constant reduction of architecture to its image 
and thus the related reduction of architecture to the concerns of meaning enacts a second reduction. With it, the possible relationship between form creation and criticality is reduced to no more than a mere trope within a generalized condition of discourse creation. What would matter would be another account. Criticality would fall outside the province of form creation. And remember, Malievich sees that the locus of establishing a discontinuity is not by telling a story about the need to enact discontinuity, but within the creation of form itself. Malievich will identify this possibility, the one that uh, wants for mere continuity, in terms of a desire for perfection. And what one needs to come from, come from Malievich's position is the overcoming of this desire for perfection, the idea that there will be a complete image that will enact the new. Bataille, come back, yes. Bataille, Georges Bataille, the French philosopher, died 1958, some time, time like that, productive before the war and just after, Second World War, not Star Wars. Bataille, who is ever present, though will give these reflections a sense of an ending, works through an overcoming of this possibility, the possibility of idealization, in terms of what he calls base materialism. I'll come back to the centrality of Bataille for any thinking about form creation. In Malievich's own career, a concentration on these questions involved in part the move from painting to architecture. He gave up painting for a time in the early 1920s, and the majority of his work was then centered on architectural research. And it's very interesting, in, especially in an architectural school, to ask the question of what is architectural research? It was research in a strict though limited sense. His concern was the creation of architectural forms that moved away from the figure, hence the question for us of the status of the image. In regard to this move, most commentators note that within the constraints of the Russian language, at least in Malievich's argumentation, the, worm, the, the terms figure and the term object are in fact the same. So an, an architecture without figure is also an architecture without object. What then is an art without figure and without objects? Within architecture, what is the correlate to this position? What is the architectural resolution to a project that is defined, at least at the outset, as the overcoming of the hold of figure and of object? What form would it have? The frame in which the answers to these questions can be located is to be found by returning to the stricture concerning fathers. We should not resemble our fathers. Furthermore, any answer, again only in part, lies in how our understanding of form creation should be directed. We should not be the peddlers of antiques. I mean, it's as though there's the critique of postmodernism avant la lettre. As will be noted, the problem here is not that of critique as independent of form creation, but as inextricably bound up with production even though it be a specific type of production. This concern with form and, the f and with form creation works in two directions. On the one hand, there is the creation of work, lines and forms. Equally, there is the interpretation of work, the interpretation of formed lines and thus form. Both are in play. To neglect the second would be to interpret images that appear to be mere lines and thus simple forms as though they bore an unproblematic unproblem relation to the history of lines and figures, as though they were themselves therefore simply the prolongation of that history. In general terms, if there is a history of lines, if there is a history of architectural figures, if there is a history of geometry, it has to do with a continual reconfiguration of lines to look at the disjunctive relationship between the line and the spline and not to see one as continuous with the other. There isn't, therefore, an infinite extension within the history of the line. The latter, infinite extension, defines architecture either in relation to the continual presence of ideal geometries, Colin Rowe, or to the, con or the, or to the continuity of the image of architecture as always being the transparent presentation of some architectures having some essential quality. Kenneth Frampton's argument that the joint, the idealization of the joint provides 
access to all architectures in all cultures forever. Well, so there's two forms of idealism. One, one is an idealist version of idealism, Colin Rowe, the idealization of geometry. The other is an idealization of matter, Frampton stuff on arguments of to do with the joint. Both need to be understood, if only then to be moved beyond. While these positions appear to be distinct, they cohere, since in both instances the image's meaning would take precedent over the image understood as the result of a series of effects, and thus the presentation of an array of techniques. There would be no need to look twice, let alone question the architectural status of what was being presented. The former, the history of the line as the continuity of its reconfiguration, continuity as discontinuity, <coughs> opens up another history, one given by the problematic relation between different configurations of lines and thus different configurations of what counts as the <coughs> image of architecture. At the same time as Malievich is forming a position that will, con that will cause the interpretation of the image to become problematic, to make us demand to ask the question, what is it that you're asking me to see? And this occurs precisely because of the refusal of the figure, and thus to insist that the figure or object be viewed as figureless or objectless. At the same time this is going on, the German philosopher Walter Benjamin is sketching a series of notes on the nature of lines and the question of their comprehension. While one of these notes will have the provocative title, Perception is Reading, more significantly for Benjamin, it will be an encounter with lines, marks and painting that will have an important affinity with Malievich. So and I want to talk just a little bit about Walter Benjamin, a very important, very significant German philosopher writing precisely at the same time to try and indicate that this preoccupation with lines lodged beyond questions of representation and then, God forbid, beyond questions of meaning is central to a certain understanding of the modernist project in the 20s. And it's very interesting that we only see that now because what we're interested in is form and lines. We're not interested in meaning. Meaning is the after effect. It's not generative. Now this occurs for two reasons. In the first instance because of Benjamin's insistence on defining these terms in relation to terms of, uh, of line, surface, mark, etc. to defining these terms in relation to interiority and not to the representation within a work of that which figured externally. And secondly, because of the introduction of a form of immateriality. And it seems to me that's what's so fundamental in our thinking is we've got to understand the notion of the immaterial, which sounds slightly mystical or transcendental, it's not. It's rather that if we're going to understand a line as having potentiality, that potentiality is an always already present immaterial force. In his short text, Benjamin, uh, short text by Benjamin called in English On Paintings or Signs and Marks, this position emerges initially in relation to the graphic line. The importance of this form of line is in how it comes to acquire its identity. I mean, what is a line? Is a line simply a mark? And if you go to this, just to make the menu nice and clear, this, it, pretend it's all white bar this. This is not background until this is added. This is not, <coughs> this only becomes a line because of its capacity to construct a background. In other words, that the identity of this and these are dependent upon each other. Therefore, their meaning, their identity, come, is interior to the creation of the brain. The importance of this form of line is in how it comes to acquire its identity. It emerges in contrast to the surface, and this has for Benjamin both metaphysical as well as a graphic significance. The graphic line marks out an area, and as such, that area becomes its background. Reciprocally, of course, a graphic line exists in relation to, but equally in its differentiation from the background. Background, therefore, has a fundamental meaning for drawing because it sustains identity. While the, significant, while, the significant, while the significance graphically of background cannot be denied, of equal importance is what Benjamin refers to as the metaphysical dimension. This has to be understood as to do with the conferring and thus the securing of identity. Benjamin writes, and I quote, 
the graphic line confers an identity on its background. The zero, therefore, would not be the surface. Rather, the surface would be constituted as background by the presence of a line. If there is a zero condition, it is the relation of dependency between line and background. The zero, therefore, will take on the quality of being the always already more than one. And this will become fundamental for how we understand Malievich's notion of a zero and that one then for what it means to build on zero. Of equal relevance, especially in relation to the thinking of the surface, is the following comment made by Benjamin. The identity of the background of a drawing is quite different from that of a white surface on which it is inscribed. We might even deny it that identity by thinking of the white surface as a surge of white waves. Then he adds, and this is the absolute clinching moment, he adds, though these might not be even distinguishable to the naked eye. What is of note in this formulation is that this difference may not be evident to the eye. In other words, despite having a graphic presence or graphic result, it would not simply be present graphically. Here is the second affinity with Malievich. For both the surface is more than a literal surface. It's a field of activity. It's a site of potentiality. It is in a verbal sense at work. Within drawing, thought by Benjamin in terms of the, of, of the pure drawing, surfaces cannot be reduced to the status of blank white space. A way of understanding what Benjamin means by the metaphysical can be located in the distinction between simple graphic presence and what is not given to the eye. The limit of the eye becomes the refusal of the image as the end in itself. I mean, the hubris of the belief that we can see everything is to refuse to conceive that there is an immaterial presence, a potentiality at work in a line that's always in excess of its simple graphic presence. That's why, for example, one can see in a diagram representational possibilities, even though the diagram itself may not be representational. That possibility is a potentiality. But it, to argue it, to maintain that as a position, necessitates seeing in the line more than simple empirical presence. There is an important consequence that emerges here, namely that once exteriority cedes its place to interiority, one, in other words, when we no longer see lines as represent, representational, but by creating an internal world, then their, then their connection, the relation between lines, has to be thought beyond the confines of a simple opposition. Then exterior, exteriorization emerges as a question. In other words, if this is not a representation, what's it like to exteriorize this? In other words, to see it having a relation outside of itself. If there's not an outside that's dragged in, what happens when you want to project that out? The actual formulation of this as a conceptual concern reiterates a current preoccupation with the diagram and thus with the relationship between a digital image and its materialization. Now, there's a lot more that I would want to argue there. I'll just leave that hanging and come back to it. And I want to move to a more detailed discussion of lines. When you just keep looking at this. The, draw, the drawn line, you can see I'm not really a very good at architectural things because I just show you images to keep you amused. The drawn line, rather than prove to you, I can't point to you and say, you see this, it's all proved. Just listen. The drawn line does not have an automatically determinable status. The relationship between lines drawn on a page once again does not have an automatically identifiable identity. And yet there is an identity. What is occurring, at least initially, is the presence of abstraction. This is abstract, but why? Why is it abstract? It's not abstract because it doesn't represent. That's the banal version of abstraction. Prior to broaching the abstract, then the relationship between abstraction and the lines becoming more determinant, a becoming that has both its own conditions of possibility as well as effects, there is the more complex problem of the way the line comes to acquire the status that it has. The line's status is inextricably connected to the line's presentation. What the line presents will differ to the extent that this presentation is or is not located within a generalizable framework of representation. 
So if I said to you, you, I perceive this through within the structure of representation, the first question you'd say is, sure, what does it represent? What is there outside of, of which this is the representation? And you'd say, well, nothing, because there's nothing out there. So it's the negation of figure. This is to misunderstand what abstraction is. If I said you see that interpreted beyond the framework of representation, then the question of what it is that figures within the abstraction, what is figured by the abstraction, re-emerges as an important question. What, is meant, uh, what the line presents will differ, as I said, to the extent that representation is at work. What is meant by extent has both an interpretive as well as a temporal quality. Representation, understanding the image as being the image that will come to be, even may come to be built, may figure from the beginning. Hence, either the drawing or the digital image can be located as part of a linear sequence. Representation would predominate from the start, and thus the image would be a representation, and thus would demand to be interpreted as such. A demand which, as with all demands, it is possible to negotiate. Or, on the other hand, there is the possibility that the image is not to be interpreted representationally. It doesn't represent. Hence, its relation to a future representation, and, and such representations would be essential if productive plans and sections were to be created, would of necessity have to be disjunctive. In other words, if there's a simple linear progression between X, Y, and Z, then one has to think of that relation in terms of conjunction and linearity. If one sees, thinks of this outside the structure of representation, then the relationship always has to be disjunctive. And what's interesting and so, so wonderful about the disjunctive is that within these disjunctions, in these moments where we have to negotiate a relationship, these, this defines sites of research within architecture as always already internal to the practice of architecture. So research is bound up with architecture's autonomy, but only bound up with it once one breaks with linearity and forces through the necessity for the disjunctive. Once the problem of representation is in play, so is, then, so is the equally vexing concern of the relationship between the line's graphic presence and thus a form of materiality, and the potential within graphic presence, a potential that almost by definition does not succumb to the hold of the literal. And you can see, for example, in the work of someone uh, like Lars Spyruck, what's so important about that work is that the move from the digital models to analog models to digital models always works through the disjunctive. In other words, that you move from one set to another knowing that these things are not coterminous but always disjunctively connected. And it's within the disjunctions that one can continue to do research. If it was simply a matter of sheer extrusion, then research would vanish as a possibility. Loosening this hold is to approach, as I said, or I want to argue, the condition of zero. But zero understood as the always already present more than one. Though I know that sounds fabulously post-structural, it will make sense in a moment. Not only, therefore, does the presence of this potential overcome the possibility of establishing any straightforward understanding of what a representation may mean. It does at the same time introduce what will have to be called an ineliminable immateriality into any concern with the line. An important component of the argument here is that integral, to, is that an integral part of Malievich's, Malievich's references to another dimension and thus a part of what is in fact at work within the project of suprematism is wrestling with the presence of this ineliminable immateriality. And again, if that sounds slightly bizarre, bear with it. What's interesting uh, amongst the, in the history of, say, German architecture and German architectural theory is the distinction between empiricism, which was interested simply in, the, in materials, and what Gottfried Zemper would call materialism. What, what made materialism so important is that within the work you had what the Germans bless them would call a Kunstwollen, where the Wollen is this will within the matter. It wills itself. Now this is an immaterial possibility attributed to hard stuff, to matter. Now Malievich wrote rather odd theosophical, philosophical ideas which we can 
happily put to one side, in my view at least, because what he was searching for was a way of articulating and giving sense to the notion of the immaterial. In other words, when we move beyond the reduction of matter to empirical form, we move beyond the reduction of ma the materialist to the empirical, then we need an account of what is there more, what is the, the greater quality that matter has that allows for it to be not reduced to the simply empirical presence. For, for a lot of German theorists, that was, that was Kunstvoll, and it was the, the will within the, the, uh, the work. From Bertica right through to Zemper, there was this concern with an, an animate quality within matter. Malievich was also searching for an explanation of an animate quality within matter. So his writings, bizarre as they are for us now, need to be read in that light, in, in my view. Uh, perhaps blah, 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 blah. a position already gestured at by Benjamin as that which works beyond the whole of the eye, and thus eschews the equation of line and image. For Benjamin, this will lead to naming. For Malievich, a different path opens up. Perhaps almost as a prelude to any introduction of these topics as questions, lines, abstraction, representation, the material and the immaterial, it is worth noting the way Malievich tries to formulate what would count as an attempt to articulate potential. The connection to pure abstraction, I hope, will be evident from the start. This is one of my favorite Malievich quotes. I quote, excitement, like molten copper in a blast furnace, seethes in a state that is purely objectless, purely without fear. Excitement, Combustion is the supreme white force that sets thought in motion. Excitement is like the flame of a volcano that flickers within a human being without the goal of meaning. Hence it's pure flickering, it's pure becoming, it's pure potentiality. He goes on, a human being is like a volcano of excitements as opposed to thought which is concerned with perfections. So we want to s drag from this a distinction between the volcano of excitements and the idea of forma finalis, of final form. And, that, and within that distinction, you should already note the silent, though nonetheless redolent, presence of Georges Bataille's notion of the informe. At work here is a type of hinge. The hinge links the purely objective to that which excitement will realize. Equally, it is, present, it is present linking the goal that is defined as without meaning to that which formally comes to acquire meaning. It's very interesting that the, the, the German uh, uh, architectural writer and architect, indeed Gottfried Zemper, also says that any art worthy of its name operates, and I quote, without the goal of meaning. Meaning is always the after effect of the operation of materials. Again, it is the link between the diagram and architectural's formal and thus material presence that's at stake. In some, what is at work here is the attribution of potential to abstraction. This will inform seeing, though no longer a simple seeing. There is an important corollary here with his, his uh, friend, Lazitsky, with Malievich. To the extent that a movement through the latter's work, Lazitsky's, can be charted, such that the original abstraction of the prowns gave way to a type of collage technique in the construction of the political poster in the 1920s, then what is at work is the overcoming of an initial abstraction and the movement towards a specific determined direction. And just historically, it's worth noting, the great political problem of constructivism was this. If this is political art, and it is, what happens when you do the political poster and give this formal content and content with meaning? then the politics is located in what's being said. It's located in the meaning. But, and this is Lizitsky's hold, the drama of Lizitsky's career can be to move from the abstraction of the initial prounds through to identifying politics with meaning and content, which perhaps was inevitable given the situation. Where, where Malievich stands back, and I add parenthetically, rightly or wrongly, is he continued to see the critical and hence the political in abstraction. And if you do that, you can never move to a realm of meaning. So what's interesting is that by holding to abstraction, what becomes necessary is criticality, understood as the critical observer. In other words, it's only by holding to abstraction that you bring in the mass to look at this and then talk about it. By giving it meaning already, you don't need the mass because you've told them what, they, what you think. So there's an enormous problem about the politics of the image uh, that can be traced 
in the distinction between Malievich and Lisitsky precisely over what happens to Lisitsky's prowns in the 20s, which looks like a very academic sort of blah, blah, blah thing to say, but it's not. It's tremendously interesting because if there is a politics of architecture, it resides in maintaining something like a theory of abstraction as opposed to seeing criticality in either instrumentality or, God forbid, in meaning. So if there is a critical engagement uh, with, with, with Lisitsky, it takes place uh, over this precise form. Now, what's interesting is that Lisitsky was the first, along with Malievich, to make sense of the term zero. And zero is fundamental for the argument. The status of the zero is, 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 uh, is essential. For Lisitsky, however, Malievich, and I quote here Lisitsky, wanted to reduce all forms, all paintings, to the zero. And then he, Lisitsky, says, this is a misunderstanding of the zero. This is Lisitsky. For us, however, this zero was the turning point. We have a series of numbers coming from infi infinity, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. It comes down to the zero, then begins with an ascending line, zero, one, two, three, four, five. The lines are ascending from the other side of the picture, uh, end quote. Allowing for the zero to be positioned on either side of a progression gives to the work not just a context, but locates it at a point of intersection. It's as though the world bears down on the work, the work becomes zero. The work projects into the world from the position of zero. So that's the way Lisitsky began to understand the way in which a work comes to presence and has a projective quality only if it maintains the condition of zero. So there is then a, a Lisitsky type critique of his own move to political posters. Allowing for the zero to be positioned on either side of a progression gives to the work not just a context, but locates it at a point of intersection. At the zero point, therefore, two sets or worlds coincide. Art as a productive and as an interpretable object is defined by its location at the zero. The zero, therefore, has a locative quality. Locative simply means no more than pertains to location. For Lisitsky, the zero had everything to do with location. It was locative. Therefore, it was static. It was about place. Malievich is radically different, importantly different. The contrast between Lisitsky and Malievich can be located at this zero. Yet the contrast with the point defined as an intersection is not deposit the point as pure simplicity. To do so would define the zero, what will emerge in contrast to Lisitsky as Malievich's zero, as an axiom. It would have the status, therefore, for in Lisitsky's work of a Cartesian point. We need to move beyond this notion of zero. And you can already see the relationship between the Cartesian point as the axiom and the Leibnizian point, which for informs animation as the point through which an infinite number of lines uh, intersect. The zero, therefore, will be defined neither by location nor as having a founding purity. In contrast to both, indeed distancing both, the zero has to be understood as the site of original potentiality. What, what in Malievich's terms was there as having excitement. As such, the locative pertaining to place would cede its place to the actative pertaining to action. And the actative is a wonderful word. You can only find it in the 12-volume Oxford Encyclopedia, but it's a good one to use. Actative pertaining to action. So if we, if we understand this in terms of its locative quality, we see it as it's suggesting place. If we understand it in terms of its actative quality, we see it as potential. And therefore, our, the project is, what is, this, what is these, the potential of this work? And that's the, for Malievich, rightly or wrongly, that's the political question. To return to Malievich, still to his words, the perception of the image needs yet more preparation, though not too much more. The formulation that identifies the purely objectless with excitement and identifies both with molten copper is central. As a beginning, it is vital to recall that the term objectless has implicated in it the sense of figureless as well. And yet, the moment these different senses are noted, it begins to look that all that is at play is a theory of abstraction structured by the opposition between the figure and the abstract, a structure where one is defined as the negation of the other. Moreover, this sense of abstraction and figure, equally this sense of negation, is one that allows the abstract to become more precise and reciprocally the abstract to be identified with that which lacked formal precision. 
And it's precisely this conception of abstraction and figure I'm suggesting that Malievich's point, Malievich's argument makes us want to move away from. Uh, within this structure, if the line were a machine overcoming abstraction, it would be no more than a machinic operation which the zero attained form, conjunctively rather than disjunctively. Not only is this a banal conception of the relationship between the figurative and the abstract, it also fails to understand the central element alluded to in Malievich's own formulation, and which will always be there in any understanding of abstraction that defines it beyond the hold of simple oppositions, and thus beyond the hold of negation. <laughs> the word, Malievich's word, not mine, his word, is excitement. Excitement is potential. The zero has to be productive, and this and thus will have an already just disjunctive relation to that which appears after the objectless. Indeed, posing the problem of the zero not, not only introduces the complicating factors with, within Malievich's work, it also introduces the problem of perception. How is abstraction, the zero, to be viewed when its relation to an after image, that is, of course, not its after image? must always be disjunctive rather than conjunctive. Now some images. The first set of images, is this going to work? Oh, it does. The first set of images are what are called suprematist paintings dating from 1915. And, and these have enormous influences on, 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 on the theorization of contemporary architecture. You just have to look at Van Dersburg, Mises' brick country house project and Colin Rowe's attempt to bring them together to see the connections that, that these paintings have on architecture's capacity to theorise its own activity. The question of what is to be seen only emerges with real force once it is recognised that these are not potential buildings. What is at play here is zero. The latter, the zero, I quote Zemalievich again, is the ring of transformation of all that is with object into the objectless. This is the transformation of the object into the objectless. This is the transformation of the figure into the figureless. Two questions are central here. The first is how transformation is to be understood. The second is the status of the zero. Nonetheless, there is a preliminary one concerning perception and the status of the object. The question is straightforward. Of what are these images? I'm showing them to you. Of what are they images? And how would you just, I mean, parenthetically, just take a, a two seconds out, how would you begin to answer that question? What theory of the image do you bring to this in order to answer the question, of what are these images? It can't just simply be seen that I see them and they're this, they're pink and blue and yellow and white and red, black. That's not a theory of the image. That's simply to describe what's on the screen. What theory of the image do you bring in order to answer the question of what are these images? There's no escape from these theoretical questions. Even if the question of the zero were preempted, what remains is the problem of what it means to view, to see, to perceive zero. The answer to this preliminary question is to be found in the relationship between potentiality and the objectless. The latter, the objectless, the figureless, has now to include the dimensionless. Hence, present in these images are not two-dimensional forms that can be extruded into a third dimension. They are without dimension. Hence, the disjunctive relation to form. If these are without dimension, it's not a question of giving them a dimension. However, they cannot be simply the objectless and the dimensionless. This is the case not just for the straightforward reason that the presence of colour and scale warrants an account on its own. It's because the zero is, as I've tried to suggest, a site of potentiality. The zero for Walter Benjamin called for the name. Here the zero has a different exigency. The negation that yields the zero, namely the transfiguration of the object into the objectless, cannot be simply negated in order then to produce an object. The negation itself, the zero as a negation, must be productive. And just, just to pause, hopefully my last pause, 
One of the nice things about the French language is the use of the word in to give you the negative. So in French, the opposite of form is informe. And we, because we don't think, translate then to English as formless. And that's completely wrong. And when Bataille writes about the informe, to lapse into French for a nanosecond, it's an informe qui forme. Namely, it's, of, it's that without form, which forms. And what is fundamental to the writings of Bataille, and equally to a, a collaborator of his, Maurice Blanchot, is the notion of productive negativities. Namely, that something is negative, like the inform, but it's not the negation of form. It's, an, it's that which produces form. It's a bit like the it's a bit like finding a notion of potentiality defined negatively, our form, and it's the our form which is continually finding form, but it continually finds form outside of a structure of finality. There is no form of finales to the our form. As I say myself, the affinity with Bataille's conception of the our form should be clear. And yet, Supremus number 58, of which this is the image, Though this is far more exact than Supremus number 56, these are, this, is the, this is the degree zero of painting. While they're, what, while they're to be seen, sorry, this painting still has qualities. While they're to be seen, they occur, however, as the condition of zero. Within the work, note the, note the large black line. What used to be done in architecture schools is this was turned into an urbanism. And you say, okay, now, this is a road. <laughs> See it? These are houses. Got it? And then you go off to the studio and you turn this into an urban project. And that was a very interesting thing to do. And what you were doing was seeing that is implicit. And yet, in some sense, it's there. Within the work, the black line distributes the elements in size and color. They're distributed by that black line. Size and color may work to indicate a volume. However, even if that's true, it must be volume at the degree zero. The centrality of the lines of distribution construct adjacencies with other lines and other volumes. All exist in terms of potentiality. Imagine you're sitting at your computer and you're making these gorgeous rhino sausages in different colors and you've got them wiggling into each other. You've got adjacencies, you've got sausages, big, little ones, fat, green, red, all sorts of things. You've got precisely this. What do you, as it were, what do you see there? What is there to be seen? From the Malievichin's perspective, you see zero. Not nothing, but zero. The centrality of the lines, as I said, uh, constructs adjacencies with other lines, other volumes. All exist, however, at the zero degree, therefore in terms of potentiality. Once seen as zero, then the potential for volume that exists in the elements distributed by the black line cannot reside in the appearance of volume. Volume resides in potential. Beyond the whole of appearance, the question of what the realization of volume will entail, more emphatically, what, it, what, what would its appearance be, attains its real force. As was mentioned, this is as much a theoretical or a philosophical question concerning potentiality as is the architectural one concerning the image within which architecture drawing uh, by architectural image it is to be restricted in this instance to an image that has a generative quality for example drawing sketches diagrams etc etc part of the important difference between philosophy and architecture can be located in the way questions pertaining to potentiality are either posed or resolved hence Malievich's <laughs> insistence that you resolve the problem not on the level of argument province of philosophy, but on the level of form creation, the province of architecture. The difficulty is maintaining the zero on the level of the architectural image. If the zero conditions are read simply planometrically, then, as was mentioned, the plan may be simply extruded. If, however, the line is understood as that which distributes and organizes differing programmatic possibilities, then the line no longer has mere graphic presence. As such, the line is informed. <coughs> there would be, therefore, an importantly different relation between the line and what will continue to appear, though not be, as volumes. Their size and color, as you see here, already indicate a concern with programmatic difference and the question of scale. They are now distributed, however, by a different sense of line. 
The line may enact infrastructural possibilities or mark the flow of movement through time. The changes in colour and gradations of scale would indicate differing possibilities, not at one time but through time. That's the possibility within the word potentiality. In sum, the line would no longer represent. Rather, it is informed and thus informed. It spaces on the condition, but only on the condition, that it is a timed line. And a line existing through time is not the line thought within representation. Maintaining the zero is to maintain potentiality prior to form. The key here, of course, is not space. The key here is the central architectural term, <coughs> namely time. To interpret the image as representational is to view its potential as already having been realized, and thus any further movement accepts the point of completion as the zero degree. Clarification, in extension, refinement become further instances of completing. Potentiality, excitement, is realized, brought to an end, the moment the line is completed, since the line will have already completed. This repeats Malievich's claim that thought is concerned with perfection. Perfection as opposed to excitement is, com is completion as opposed to potentiality. We never aim for completion, we aim for excitement. Within completion. The introduction of time, time brings movement with it, undoes the conditions of representability, namely stasis. These, confirms, these concerns define the way the development of Malievich's architectural research is to be approached. In a sense, it has to do with the distinction between meaning and potentiality. Insisting on the static image, the image is both static and complete, involves the inevitable attribution of meaning to the elements. All they could do is mean. Again, recall Malievich's point noted above, that excitement is like a flickering flame that occurs, and I quote, without the goal of meaning. Meaning is not the telos, form creation is. And yet this is not to posit form as an end in itself. Rather, it is to insist on an inherently disjunctive relation between potentiality and its realization. Given the disjunction, the question will always be how disjunction moves to conjunction. And I think you could begin to identify interesting architectural projects if you go back to uh, Friotto's work with analog computer models in which those then move to other sorts of models. You can begin to see that the move from one to the other has to be explained disjunctively rather than conjunctively. There is a conjunction, but it's by overcoming a discontinuity. However, however, given the disjunction, as I've said, the question will always be how disjunction moves to conjunction. However, that as a mode of research and inquiry, which indeed it is, involves bringing considerations to bear on the image that refuses it the possibility of a smooth and continuous self-presentation. It attains the status of zero, not because it either presents or represents, but due to its harboring a potential that is always to be realized. Only by holding, I would argue, to the centrality of disjunction can the architectural drawing, the diagram, have a yet-to-be quality. It comes to be realized through the attributions of qualities to it that are always external rather than internal to its representational hold. Hence the description of the lion as informed by time and movement, with, or, or even using time and movement to construct the lion. There's a fundamental difference between a spline and a line drawn between two points, even though on a screen they may lo look like straight lines. Within this process, now a process of form creation, a process starting at zero, the next series of diagrams would always begin to work out how such a possibility will generate a new series that on the level of the image, on the level of what is seen, need not have a necessary relation to their point of generation. The latter point is the image of and with potentiality. Lines, once allowed potential, take on, and only then can take on, the capacity for experimentation. These slides date from 1915 to 1926. They include a series of intense architectural research which led to the development, of which I'll show you of in a minute, of things that Malievich called the uh, architecton. Prior to commenting on them, it is worth noting the way a type of movement takes place. While some of these images <coughs> can, 
Con that's one of the architectons. Contain the word supremus in, the, uh, in their name. Nonetheless, there is a move from a concern with painting to architecture. Maintained through that development is, of course, the zero. This is an image seen at the degree zero. How? Hence, the problems we negotiated concerns the difference, if difference there be, between painting at zero and building on it, that is, building on zero. The on, the building on zero, the on, as will be suggested, will always have to be maintained beyond any logic of addition. To build on zero can never involve the addition of one to zero. A range of issue arises here. However, that the question will always concern the status of the image. What here is there to be seen? What is here to be seen as the condition of zero? Beginning to answer this question necessitates introducing an additional element to the argument. For reasons of brevity, it can only be stated. Defining an image in terms of potentiality introduces a founding sense of plurality. This is a claim about the ontology of the image, not one about meaning. It's not as though this has multiple meanings, as though that's a claim about semantics. Accepting the argument, this has a plurality of possibilities because of the ontology of the object. Potentiality continues to open itself up, not to more meanings, but to further possibilities. This is a claim, as I said, about the ontology of the image, not one about meaning. Meaning, as I'm trying to insist, is only ever an after-effect of the operation of work. As such, even an image that may seem to demand the interpretation of representation, a framework insisting on the privileging of a static spatiality over a dynamic process, will always occasion a viewing in which abstraction can be reintroduced. Even, for example, the maison domino can be perceived diagrammatically. In other words, perceived in terms of harboring a potentiality and thus able to generate further images that have qua image and thus organizational logic a disjunctive relation to the foundation, founding abstract image, this junction holding the zero as the place of activity. The immediate response, the one that can be made to all these images, is that the move from abstraction refuses the zero by turning the abstraction into the opposite of figure. In other words, it rids abstraction of its generative quality. Stasis, the static image, would have replaced potentiality. Now, I mean, I, I mean I, I'm going on for hours. I'll be very quick now. Th this is, these, there's a series of drawings here. And, you know, if this is an architecture class and it's not, it's not. Uh, the, this line would be, would be really tremendously important in relation to this line, in relation to the whole history of the drawings of plans and the privileging of one mode of drawing over other modes of drawings. Shift. Uh, architectural drawing and it's called the house for earth dwellers the people 1923 to 4 and there's a whole series of drawings like this the, the question is can this image work at the condition of zero is that possible the answer will depend on what is seen one form of argument with Malievich would be to argue that the image and specifically the image of the architecton rids the zero of potentiality now, the, the, the argument would be based on, on this, that the use of the shading here, the move from white to black, and then in, in this case, no. The use, the, the, the ineliminability of shadow that falls on all of these <coughs> introduces in the representation in the representation, something that disrupts the zero condition by introducing a quality that robs it of this, it's this idea of pure potential by, I can't help but see the shadowed area versus the non-shadowed area. So I could, if I wanted to be critical of Malievich's argument this is zero, highlight the way in which shadow operates in the photographic presentation of the architectons. The zero would not be undone by addition, Rather, and more significantly, a, an original state of the dimensionless is retroactively undone by the introduction of the shadow. Seeing these images as an exteriorization 
of an initial suprematist drawing would form the basis of such an argument. Implicit within this conception of exteriorization, however, is the commitment to continuity and conjunction, especially on the level of the image, as that which allows for an ex interior to acquire an exterior. However, and this is, this is the interesting point, that's the critical engagement with this. The role of the shadow undoes potential. Now, if Malievich were in the room, he'd say, no, 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 you're misunderstanding. Look at it again. Look, forget the shadow, look at it. This is, and what you'd see is the zero as potentiality, as molten copper, as excitement. You'd see this as an arrangement of pure form that is generative. The fact that it, a shadow falls on it is one of those things, would have to be argued. This is what he wants to preclude, this claim, by the use of words such as potentiality and excitement. Allowing for it, therefore, necessitates stilling the possibility of a retroactive undoing of potentiality through the introduction of the shadow. By, and this occurs by maintaining the disjunctive relationship between the zero and what concerns, concern, comes afterwards. Between them is a further site of experimentation, a site whose project is the continuity of form creation, a design process that will continue to inflect the zero as much as the one. Now, finally, finally, Bataille was haunted by the figure of the academic man, who isn't, the man whose frock coat would garb the world clothe what is, rendering it useless and perfect. This man takes on a figure of a certain conception of the philosophical. Hence, undoing its hold, this hold of the academic man, the one with his frock coat who turns the world into perfection, undoing its hold is as much to reconfigure form creation as it is to rethink the philosophical. The limit at which philosophy and architecture touch, and they need only ever touch, would be where zero took on the condition of nudity. Nudity, however, is not the condition of zero. Nudity is the addition, what could be described as the unoriginal condition, in which the zero is always in excess of itself. The excess, however, is not the addition of one to zero. Rather, the zero is the ineliminable potentiality. <coughs> Realising the potentiality of nudity, therefore, becomes the question of architectural form, operative in a domain whose parameters are continually being set and negotiated. It's only by holding to the zero that it's possible to see in nudity that which will develop another architecture. Thank you. Take some questions. Yeah, yeah, I mean, to be frank, the whole thing, to the, fr whole thing. Yeah. the whole thing is, is, is you know, the whole thing is based on the argument that his, ar my argument, that his argument is that what technical innovation does is cause us to rethink the history of art. So when he argues that uh, the advent of cinema, the advent of reproducibility, generates concepts and categories that are new, they're also inappropriate to fascism, they're inappropriate to lots of things, but they cause us to, to recapitulate the history of art. So it's not as though we abandon art forms, we rethink their presence within a different conceptual framework. So this is an attempt, and it could be dramatically unsuccessful, I assure you, this, could, this is an attempt to rethink, and this whole book is, is this comes from, is an attempt to rethink drawing and lines after the advent of the digital image. So instead of saying, well, look, we can just forget about all of that stuff, you say, well, what happens when you rethink it? Is there something there that may be useful in one's thinking about a theory of design or a philosophy of design or architectural theory? So that's the point of departure, is the Benjaminian argument. No, 
No, but you see, but see, I mean, to be honest, again, I mean, I mean, you know, if one's, and I'm sure, I mean, you know, to be attentive to Benjamin's arguments is he always talks about the kunst form, the the form of art. He never talks about the the, the content. So what interested him with cinema, and that's what disturbed him about cinema as well, was he it was I mean Benjamin is the super formalist, and I think that's a great thing. He's interested in, in what the form allows for. The fact that there's an inherent fragility, namely that the form can be used against the forces of progress, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, only indicates that there's no such thing as a purely politically correct form. But it's what it's be, what's the potential is there within the form. So what I guess what I'm doing is saying, look, what's interesting if you chart Lazitsi's career and Malievich's career, the battle over the politics of art is, though they didn't put it this way, is an argument about the nature of abstraction. Now most people who then interpret Malievich get hung up on all the suprematist, sort of Ospensky sort of stuff, and give it a sort of spiritualist, re and that's possible, absolutely. But I've tried to reinterpret that by saying that what he's looking for and he finds it in the worst areas, is an attempt to articulate a position that is at the same time materialist and anti-empiricist. And that's, a, as, as we say in Australia, a big ask to do that. And he found it in Ospensky. Well, you know, but, but what, what, what's, such, what's so wonderful in your question, I mean, it's, a, it's absolutely the right question, is what, you're not supposed to answer this, it's rhetorical, is what you mean by intended to be realised. And, and every, the whole paper is about an attempt to, to make that expression a problem. Because there's a sense in which intending to realise this, that thing there, takes you to that as the model. And then that gets sent to a developer and that gets built. So on one level, intending to realise is to see that as a maquette made out of balsa wood, and that's it. Now, if that's not meant, if that's not, whoops, bugger, if that's not what is meant by attending to, 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 uh, to realise, then the whole problem is, what does it mean to intend to realise something? And that then, to me, becomes, a once you, see, all my point would be is that once you accept that that's a question, then it's a question. And that's not meant to be a silly thing to say, but once you accept it's a question, then it becomes a locus of research. Then there's no automatic move from one to another. If you don't accept it's a question, it's just straightforward, then it's easy. And it's really trying to insist on moments of interruption or the disjunctive, even in a world of, you know, uh, of, of a certain type of use of the computer in which it, it seems everything is simply a matter of allowing things just simply to take place, even to see within that the possibility of disjunctive relations. And I mean, the reason why I've, I've, I'm so interested and have written a lot about Lars Spybrook's work is precisely because even though he doesn't theorize it this way, I see his continual oscillation between digital and analog models and the way in which what happens when you open up an analog computer model back into Maya, you'll have unpredictable consequences of so doing and equally the way in which you can then begin to see a differing sorts of relations between materials where the truth of, st of steel is found in paper, etc., etc., etc. All of these are a series of discontinuous connections. And equally in the work of, of, of Sula and Colleton and Bill MacDonald, where you move very simply from the digital image, the digital photograph, that is then opened up uh, in Photoshop, and in Photoshop you have the capacity to highlight certain colors, to find certain bits that have an implicit geometry. 
you open that up into Illustrator, and, and as you and look for RGB values, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, once each of these moves has unpredictable consequences. So while they appear seamless, they're actually always introducing an extra dimension. And as you then open that up in other programs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you're creating possibilities that you then have to negotiate with. So it's never seamless, even though a lot of the story about it says it's all, you know, Deleuzian flow, pure continuity. It's not. It's always disjunctive, and those disjunctives are marked by the, the mutation, in their language, of that which could not have been predicted from the first state of affairs. So, therefore, I'm not saying, I don't know what the answer to your question is, but I'm saying it depends enormously whether you see this as a zero that opens itself up as a space of research, or as simply <coughs> that which demands to be built, and this is simply an image of it. No, I, th I, think, I think, let's take it back to a word which we don't like to use anymore, though I love using it partly for that reason, and it's the word criticality, or the critical. I mean, on the West Coast, the critical's got a bad name because it was linked to the notion of the instrumental, which is sort of a naive way of understanding the idea of the critical. The critical within Malievich has nothing to do with instrumentality. It has the, uh, the idea of how do you not do what's always been done? What is the interruption within architecture of a series of, 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 how do you understand discontinuity within architecture? So that quote I read out about not being peddlers of antiques, et cetera, et cetera, was, and he's modern, that's where he understands or formulates the modernist project of radical <coughs> departure, of, of an, a founding interruption. So therefore, it's not a, so therefore what becomes interesting is that for him as a, as a painter and as an architect, is not to resolve that problem by writing an argument or a philosophical book, but by saying that within architecture, that is done on the level of form creation. And therefore, what that means to take, what that entails taking it a stage forward, is that form creation has to be understood as form creation, not as the creation of meanings. So if you then read that back in, the whole sort of Heideggerian development within architecture is all about the creation of, of dwellings where man will live in a certain way. In other words, it's all about the creation of meaning. It's not about the creation of form. So form becomes unnecessary as a site of research. What we're really after is, is a certain ambience or a certain mode of living, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, could, sorry. sorry, could I kind of push you on that point, yeah, actually, yeah. because it, it kind of takes up Kind of what was said here. I mean, I was very struck at, at the moment, you know, without detracting from the overall argument, uh, when you talked about the way in which uh, the images of Malievich mm. would also be employed uh, for political posters. And as it were, the tragic confrontation, in some sense, of these configurations uh, suddenly with kind of political meaning. I say tragic in the sense. Uh, that, that, that either one or the other is going to prevail. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to me, you know, it's an extremely interesting kind of hypothesis in a sense for a kind of critical kind of rereading of a lot of 20th century revolutionary politics uh, <laughs> that precisely where that concern with form Reach, reaches a kind of tragic destiny is precisely when it's reappropriated by meaning. Mm. Unable as it is, in a, I mean, this, is, this would be the other side of it, to sustain the form making discourse into politics. Mm. It's as if suddenly it takes the kind of handmaiden's position of serving politics, mm. uh, which was always the way it seems to me in which kind of art betrays itself to politics long before politics is said to betray art? Well, I mean, in, in part, I, mean, I, 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 don't dispute from, I don't dispute very much that. The, the person I was more talking about was, was uh, certainly in part as Malievich, but it's very much also you know, what happens to Lozitsky yeah. 
as as um, things go on. But nonetheless, I'd also want to defend, you know, to set a certain, we can say this now with Lisicki's work to recognize there was a certain moment in which a decision led one way rather than another. But it's very difficult, I think, to maintain a politics, as it were, of abstraction. Nonetheless, that's in some sense the challenge is to see criticality linked to form creation. And once you 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 do that, and this is I think the flip side of it, that you know, and just to preface it slightly, I mean, one of the, the, the things that's happened in the architectural world as you, you probably notice is the the sort of vanishing in some sense of, of, of architectural theory and the replacing of a type of architectural cultural studies that parades as a type of architectural history. And ironically, once with the role of the, the digital, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, there has never been a greater need for architectural theory at the very moment of its being abandoned. And so, so I think that the, the, the becomes what becomes to me then very important is that to recognise that there's now a whole area of activity that has to go, that have to, we have to take up. We have to think about abstraction, potentiality, criticality, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, outside of realms of of meaning, of instrumentality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all of this, when we go back to your question at the beginning, all of this is occasioned by a shift in tech mechanical reproduction of of the technology. And it's as though what theory is doing is saying, given this, now what it's po what is possible, and what's the sad thing, uh, from my perspective at least, is theory's seen this and retreated into the arms of Clio, not the magazine, history, uh, in order to, to, to see in what sense there is to, we need to go back to think this. So therefore, to finally get to it, to all of these sorts of things, what we need to do is begin to understand what it's like to develop a theory of arch architectural abstraction, where abstraction is linked to a notion of potentiality and not see these simply th see things as fluid as flowing from one thing to another. Yes. So, so I think there needs to be then a distinction drawn. See, I mean, part of the premise of this, which is a very shaky premise, the shaky premise is the autonomy of architecture, uh, as opposed to thinking of architecture as instrumental or simply as a cultural sign or anything like that. And by holding to a notion of the autonomy of architecture, one can then begin to locate these disruptive moments or these mo potentials within architecture. So it's not politics in the sense of the political or politics in the sense of changing the world or anything like this. It's to say that there is a notion of the critical that's internal to the operation of architecture. Now, the relationship between that, the notion of the critical as, as operative within the autonomy of architecture and the project of politics necessitates a very interesting interchange between the political and the architectural. In other words, in the and that, this, see, this is where you go back then to the necessity for, for theory, for, for the critic, et cetera, et cetera, because the bottom line of all this is that without public intellectuals, without criticism, without the critic, not the person who writes the newspaper, but the archi without architectural criticism, none of this takes place. It's, it's criticism and theory that begins to identify precisely this as what is going on. So therefore, the, the, the debate or the dialogue between architecture as an autonomous practice and politics is occasioned through cultural and public activity. It's not through the instrumental building doing this. It's not through a politician saying, we can change this by doing this. It's by these, both these things emerging as a locus of interchange within the public sphere. 
And so, you know, it's a much, it's a different version of, of a politics. So that allowing for criticality is, is, as internal, as, as, as given within the autonomous discourse of architecture is simply to say that there's a notion of criticality which we can identify as proper to architecture and that figures non-instrumentally in the public realm within culture. So architecture becomes part of culture but it becomes part of culture as architecture not as a sort of a cultural sign or not as the investment of a certain political projection, etc., etc. It becomes part of culture as architecture. And that's, I mean, a bit slightly polemical, that's what I think we lose sight of at times. We want architecture to be cultural, but we don't understand it can only be cultural as architecture, and then it's, it's, it's most frightening. It's most disruptive at that particular point. Which I think kind of brings us to see the wisdom of the AA entitling Andrew's position of visiting <laughs> architectural critics. Not sure that. <laughs> um, I think we should leave it there and thank Andrew very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <clears throat>